What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And what a way to start 2020. Covering a game in 2020 that's for a series that started in 1989 where everyone looks like they're from a martial arts movie, stage 40 years in the future. This is a fighting game world where half the characters look like kung fu theater, and the other half look like they headbutted a friggin' utility pole, all with world-bending powers. That's Dragon Ball Z Kakarot in a nutshell. A 3D fighting open world RPG, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot from Namco Bandai tells the story arc of everyone's favorite spiky haired mystical martial artist Goku and his gang of misfits. Now this is a world so hardcore that dragons have seven balls and your friends are still going to give you shit for giving up during a fight even after some random dude laser finger bangs a telephone pole sized hole in your chest. Available later today and retailing for the typical price of $59.99, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot is available on PS4, Xbox, and PC. Let's see how it did. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Final Final Forms, gotta eat to get big, and fighters so badass they don't even have landing gear on their ships, they just plow right into the earth full speed. Also, this review is based on the final retail patch 1.03. Graphics are up first. The positive and negative of reflecting anime art styles in a video game, especially older ones, is that while the style is possibly more forgiving, it can, even with the slightest mistake, look like you took it easy trying to replicate it. Take, for example, Afro Samurai 2, a game so bad the developer removed it from being sold. The game was terrible, not only from an artistic representation, but just graphically overall. Remember, this was a title that was sold by Redacted Studios, which has to be one of the biggest examples of foreshadowing that's ever existed in gaming. Then again, we have other titles that nail the look of their anime source material pretty perfectly. Kakarot, though, nestles itself right in the bosom in the middle. Firstly, overall it's a solid representation of the anime and the world, the locations that Goku and his ever-revolving list of best friends who are enemies and friends who suck so much they might as well be enemies like to live in. The game's overworld is split into a larger number of locations and maps that you can choose from, including small locations off Earth when you get farther into the story. Each does have a loading section in between, but with the 1.03 patch, those have been improved tremendously. Now some maps are rather large with tons of collectibles and characters and villages and spots to explore, while others are more fronts for particular locations directly lifted from the anime and moments there. Set pieces, for instance, for some of the cutscenes to offer narrative movement to the next battle. And that means that they do many times show their age, regardless if they're channeling the alien trees of some far off world, small cities, deserts, or fields, the locations never really impress at all and they have a static feeling throughout. It's here again where Kakarot doesn't seem to know what it's going for. Old fans who don't require much or newer fans who want to see, at least in a truncated form, what all this hubbub's about. I personally would have liked to have seen them meet everybody in the middle and actually have newer, more animated maps. As a choice to directly reflect the anime, this isn't actually unexpected. It's just that later on when you're blasting around from location to location, some of the worlds look decidedly last gen, like someone just snuck in and was like, hey, you know what, this 360 game level will work right here, won't it? Once battles begin, however, the game does pick up dramatically. I haven't ever seen two mystical warriors who look like they dip themselves into Revlon Extreme Control hairspray, circling each other in a tornado made of the remnants of a dying planet as they throw mystical gang signs at one another to summon laser beams. But I assume it probably looks like this. And that is when it's at its best. Special moves and the battles themselves are actually pretty good with your assorted cavalcade of fighters swirling and diving and dipping and dashing and darting across the game world, consistently trading laser fire, special beam cannons, destructo discs, and spirit bombs between one another, tearing up the landscape or smashing the side of mountains or digging a human-sized trench through the earth if you get too close with a special move. Those little elements do help to connect the game's gameplay as well with its world state, which is vital as the title's battles try to reflect that they're happening in real time without loading into unique areas. That's where Dragon Ball Z really translates the anime at the best, in the flurry of that battle, when the two dudes who've literally died 12 times in the same fight just keep yelling, you haven't seen my final form, or I was letting you win, only to go absolutely apeshit on each other while flying through the sky again. And I say usually because that's when the game's completely asinine cameras are getting in the way. In this game's strange desire to consistently put enemies from the story way above you after a special move, where many times the same can't be said for you, it results in you spinning around unable to really see what's going on or where they are. If it's not working fine, it's letting you down, but you can never tell which of the two it's going to be. Is it unplayable? Not at all, but the game's reliance at times on zooming into your character's back during a special move or a particular moment makes for a game that looks way more clumsy than it actually is, and I think we can all agree most fighting games hinge on a good camera. 
this is something I would absolutely love to see patched as we move forward because it can really be devastating, especially when you're fighting more than one character. Now, when it comes to performance, Kakarot does well, except that someone forgot to tell the devs the PC doesn't need to be locked at 60 FPS like the consoles are. The consoles are at 60 FPS. Why is the PC version locked? It's locked at 60. Luckily, the game has no real performance issues at all. On all settings on max, a 1080 Ti with a current i7 can lock it out at 60 FPS at all times. And anything above that will see a resolution able to be bumped commensurate with that added horsepower. Sadly, the game doesn't have many graphical options at all. It basically has resolution, anti-aliasing, shadows, V-Sync, windowed, borderless, or full screen, and the ability to adjust internal resolution. A couple settings would have done incredibly nicely here. That being said, it does run really well. There's just no telling how much better you're getting than 60 frames per second because it's locked there. Not a bad looking game, but also not exactly eye catching. Also, while many of the cutscenes are excellent, a number of them are really basic, even looking more basic than some of the prior games. This results in this odd imbalance that can show up when an amazing cutscene and hugely impactful moment shows with incredible animations and attention to detail, then it drops back to the more usual level and you see this sort of static cutscene moment. We do get a lot of additional bits that we didn't see in the actual anime itself, which is cool, but that's definitely noticeable. Sound, music, and voice. Yes! Yes! That's what I like to hear! It'll all be over soon! <laughs> Don't get comfortable! You're next! Damn. Uh, Lord Frieza, it seems like those two power sources from before may warrant more of our attention. They raised their power levels almost instantly, and then vanished after defeating two of our scouts. That energy was wicked before! This energy's incredible! Sneak up on them from behind so they don't see me coming. And we're going to do music first. It's an assortment of expected cheery woodwinds and string sections with a high level of really happy moments offset by the more dreary tracks when one of your heroes faces the wrong end of their own tunnel into the afterlife. That's all fine. But it's the repetition that got to me. The choice to basically go with one major song for each overland means that first tracks play nearly goddamned endlessly. It's like being on the other side of an audiophile's personal hell. Because that same exploration song just repeats over and over and over and over again as you move to the new locations and unlock new lands, it's less of an issue. But purely due to the first place being the location you're going to be in for a great deal of time, that can be rough. And that brings us to sound. I don't think this surprises anybody. Most of it's cribbed directly from the show itself or mimicking that. And it does a good job making you feel you're playing the anime from the very start. One nice thing is that the often tinny and shallow sounds of some fighters based on Dragon Ball is not here. Well, in fact, based on a lot of anime. If there's one thing I would have liked, it would be more environmental sounds. Certainly some places can feel a little bit, as I said, graphically static, and that audio makes that even more noticeable. Overall, though, I'd say it's good. It's got some mixing and samples where they should be. You also have a couple audio mixing level adjustments you can make in the option screen. And that brings us to voice. So, a number of the actors from the original anime and later video games make a return here. As with Dragon Ball Z, we have some actors coming in and out for all of the actual shows themselves, and we do have a couple adjustments in this game. If you like this kind of thing, you know what you're getting into. They're fine. One thing to remember is that the game is telling a slightly abbreviated version of the Dragon Ball Z story, but adding some of its own elements as well. And sometimes things just don't always fit together. One part I did notice here is that many times the game hinges back on the old faithful half-hearted reuse of grunts or one-word moments from other parts of the game in the minor quest to give you narrative, resulting in every time you take in a side quest having it feel like a B-level writer of dialogue on a webisode of your favorite TV show. Especially when there's a number of these times where the inflection is off due to this, with someone saying hi or no or just grunting at the weirdest times as you press A to go through long sentences of dialogue. I think the brevity is excellent, but I don't think every time here it needs to happen at the expense of feeling like all the content was on the same level in its creation. We already have issues with B-level side missions and main level missions. I would have liked to have seen them sort of meet everything halfway. And that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. And yeah, the story's about as batshit insane as you expect. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot starts out 
pretty normally as any anime does with Goku walking around being the absolute worst father ever. Crap hits the fan with an alien known as Raditz who shows up and throws a wrench in basically everything by killing him with the aforementioned finger banging. Now while you're being resurrected in a year by the powerful Dragon Balls, your old arch enemy, who's actually your friend, kidnaps your kid to train him, and everyone's just okay with that. And by training, I really mean taking him into the forest and dropping him off and telling him if he can live six months on his own, they'll train him for the remaining six months. So basically, the earth hangs in the balance of some dude who decides to record an entire season of Bear Grylls Wilderness Survival before even helping the fucking kid out. And that's just the starting of a batshit insane series of sagas that goes on for over 30 hours. Where Kakarot excels though, is from start to finish, it adds smaller elements to the story that were not filled out in the show. Sometimes it's difficult to notice these, other times you can tell quite easily, but it's nice to see explanations for particular parts of the story be added here, as well as backstory during the side missions. While you begin the adventures with just a couple characters and you lock to them as you progress through the saga, you unlock more and more characters to play, resulting in a mini RPG style game where the story breaks off between groups and locations with you taking control of them. But don't expect a full blown RPG. To that point, what is so oftentimes reflected in Dragon Ball Kakarot is that every system other than one is always just a little less deep than it actually should be. And let's first discuss that when it has to do with the fighting system itself. The fighting in Kakarot goes a different way. Basically, you have one attack button that performs your attacks, with you hitting another button at the end of the combo string to perform finishers. When I say combo, be aware. What that actually means is how many times you hit that one button. So B, 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 Y is one, or B, 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 X is a different, or B, B, Y, or B, B, X. The game puts the timing of the finishers, the key usage, and more than a little bit of style above substance, and I would say it usually does it well, but it's going to definitely be noticeable to a lot of people. You do, even if somewhat limited, also feel like you're playing the various characters from the fiction, with you able to not only break enemies' counters, but also dash lickety split wise around the game world, flicking behind an enemy to break their counter, or bursting around your enemy to make a miss. You use key to perform special attacks, which are chosen by holding a button on your controller or keyboard, and then picking one of four that you've unlocked for your character and assigned to spots. Additionally, some characters have other special traits like Goku's transformations. Battles are back and forth with you sometimes engaging alone or in pairs or two against one or three against you. It's really not something you're going to be able to guess is going to happen until you get into the fights themselves either. When paired up, you have also the ability to build up energy and you can perform team combos right out of the anime, which admittedly are probably the coolest looking thing in the entire game. What this results in, though, is an odd feeling for a fighter. More concentration is placed on timing and finisher moves and just presentation as well as movement, which makes it feel a little bit like you're controlling the anime characters, but at the same time, those same can strikes over and over and over again, even when you begin to understand how to build key, can make it feel insanely repetitious, especially as you get deeper into the title. We all liked watching Mike Tyson knock people out, but sometimes, especially later in his career, it would have been nice to see him throw a couple combos. That's a bit of the feeling here. This is more noticeable once you get into the third and fourth stories and start facing off a lot of enemies in a row in some of the more anime-based fights. Smashing that B button and looking for openings is fun, but it never feels as deep as it really should have. And this is a place where such a focused eye on the fidelity of presentation hurts the playability despite obvious attempts to add a little bit more fleshing out of those battles. Now, when you're not in battle, you're exploring, flying or sprinting around the game world, racing and fishing and helping people with side quests, as well as furthering on the main quests and collecting orbs that allow you to buy skills. And that brings us a little bit to the RPG part of all this, or RPG Lite. Each character has their own in-depth list of skills and bonuses, and I should be clear here that sometimes it's a bit difficult to tell what something does, or at least what it improves and why. When you're looking at something that says Flaming Fondler Fist Level 2, and you're trying to figure out how that's any better than Tickling Trench Foot Number 3, it really is a bit cumbersome. Also, most of the moves have special requirements for unlocking, such as a particular level, a battle, or finding them in the game world or training for them. And while you can switch in and out any of the skills pretty much whenever you want, there isn't really a huge desire to do so. Also, there's a basic cooking system built in the game for raising attributes or adding buffs to your character. Eat to get big. Now, one portion where Dragon Ball Z does an excellent job is the various community boards and alliances system tying in the story and characters to one another in interesting ways. This was fantastic. As you meet other characters in the game world, you get corresponding spirit tokens, which can be applied to more than six community boards, like fighting, research, and others. As you put them down, each character gives bonuses to the board, and sometimes when the overall board level raises, 
It'll give you a bonus there as well, like plus one to health or reducing costs for items at stores. I actually really did like this. Also, if you have particular alliances, many times either from the game or from the anime itself, you can get additional bonuses with a title indicating what the two or three characters' relationships are. You can also give each character gifts, which raises your skill levels in the various boards. And as they raise in their relationship level to you, you get more unlocks. That's one of the deepest parts of the game and, interestingly enough, one of the most enjoyable. I liked moving around to see who gave what bonuses where and what hidden alliances I could unlock and where each character was the most useful. If you start adding in the side missions and all of the different collectibles, that is a lot of time on your hands. Whether you want to do it or not is debatable. And I say that's debatable for a couple reasons, but one is difficulty, which you guys know I like to discuss in these games. I just didn't find it that difficult at all. Sure, you can go into a couple of those first battles under leveled, but that probably won't happen as you continue on. And I barely died, especially because there's no restriction on healing potions that you can end up taking during a battle. And they're not super Super expensive. I would say if you want to go into this, you might actually have to add your own measures to increase that difficulty. Couple this into all of the upgrades and the superpowers, and it can feel a little bit odd just absolutely gutter sniping some of the later characters in the game. But does that ruin the fun factor? Well, let's see, because fun factor is next. Whether you're an old fan or a new fan, there are some things to enjoy about this title. The pomp and circumstance, the over-the-top gameplay, when it comes to those battles, uh, despite that camera issue that does crop up, there can be some very enjoyable times exploring new locations and new worlds and meeting those characters. And by God, that community board system, I absolutely fell in love with. But we are in a strange place in games when I play a title that I feel I've played 12 other times, but haven't fully played because just a bit has been added to stretch it out. Kakarot doesn't know exactly what it wants to be, a newcomer's delight embracing new fans in the frequently retold story of the Dragon Ball fighters, or old fans, best friends, regaling themselves with highlight reels of a story, hitting the best moments and maybe fleshing out others with some retelling. And that's when it's at its best. It's like two friends at a table discussing something they love, hitting those high points and then returning back to hypothesize about what they may have missed. And we get to see those moments. But when it's at its worst, it's like those same two friends ripped to the gills on Saki calling each other liars and nothing really making sense. The two sides of the game are consistently at odds. The overworld can get boring quickly, and collecting those orbs which are just floating around in lines in the game world never really captures your interest as you continue to move on, especially because some of those character skills you just probably won't even use. And while Kakarot opens up in the third and fourth story arc with you adding on to the activities you already have, no real amount of fishing or vehicles or unique locations can help you shake the feeling that it still feels a bit shallow. Also, I gotta say the side missions. You'd think with all the ways in which a game has you interact, they would try to step up these side missions, but almost all of them have you fly a short distance away and punch a deer in the ass or grab an apple for somebody, even the later ones that try to stretch it out a bit and have you fly to a different area in the game world and then punch another deer in the ass. And I think we can all agree that Falcon punching the fuck out of an entire Disney Wonderland a deer should be fun, but even later on, that got a bit old. Luckily, just as it was, there was another story bit to add, another character that popped in or another unique death that occurred or somebody coming back to life that kept me continually playing the game. Absolutely nothing about Kakarot is bad. It's just that at times it can feel a little uneventful and certainly a bit uninspired, especially when it's this long and it's trying to hammer home these over-the-top mystical ninja battle moves, but then the lack of difficulty crops up. And I know we always get caught up in this, oh, it offers this many hours of gameplay. But guess what? This many hours of gameplay doesn't mean anything if you don't want to consistently engage in it. And this is a title that definitely, as I continue to play, sort of wore thin. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating system, with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC titles, if that's the score I give it. But here, I'm going to give it a score of a wait for a sale. Now, I almost gave this actually a wait for a deep, deep sale, especially because it's Later on in the game, that shallow combat and the way everything sort of plays out can definitely be something that's bothersome. However, looking at it, seeing what it does offer and the ability for you to skip those side missions if you want and just do the main missions. And once again, some excellent storytelling when it comes to Dragon Ball Z overall. I don't think it would be fair to say it's a deep, deep sale, but you really do need to be aware of the issues going on in this title before you just jump in. And that's it for the first review. Let's hope that 2020 just gets better from here on out. Then again, Gwyneth Paltrow is selling a candle that smells like her vagina, so it can't get much worse. 
Am I comparing this game to that candle? No, because the people who made this at least tried to make something good and the game doesn't smell like a cadaver in a wet mop. I hope you guys like it. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Check out Reddit and Twitter and Facebook. And you can always become a patron at the Patreon website for ACG. It absolutely helps. It allows me to continue to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And I buy a copy of every single game I get, even if the developer gives me a code. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.